We're going to pick up again on the Marvel Run example, detailing more parts. So before we proceed further, let's go ahead and save. And one thing you may have noticed is that when you save, there's a place to enter a version description. I do find it helpful to add some phrase here. Otherwise, the versions, uh, it's very hard to tell them apart in the, in the save history. There is versioning control where you can go back to previous versions if you need. So just to simply say adding foot and strut is enough to let me know what I've done. Now, before we go proceed further, let's actually fu uh, fix an error. Um, if you remember, there was some funny inconsistencies with the section views. Let's think why. If I pick a face here at the end of my barrier and I use the look at feature, I'll get a view that looks right along the axis of that, of that, of that face, perpendicular to that face. And what we see is a subtle error. When I define the plane for this part, I used a line and an angle. But the fact is, it's at a funny cross slope on this tilted part. And so it, it gave me the plane I asked for, but it wasn't actually the plane I wanted. And the barrier part, as drawn, is slightly not perpendicular to the play field. So it won't be so easy to assemble. And you could probably hammer it together and have it work, but it won't be precisely the part I want. So let's go back and fix that. And that's also an exercise here in kind of detecting errors and seeing how to reconstruct things. I look in my design history, there was a specific moment that I defined the plane. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just is grab the grab the, the, the sort of history uh, marker and go back in time to find that point. We can see that's my plane, that's plane number two, I'll simply make it visible there. So let's choose a different way of defining the plane and replace this plane. I don't know of a way to directly modify the definition of that plane, but we can certainly insert a, insert a new one and then patch things up to match. So this time I'm gonna construct a plane and I'm gonna use the fact that we have the uh, existing slot feature and we wanna be right down the midline of it to use a mid-plane construction technique. So now I can go back in here and pick two faces and have a plane go right between the two of them. And since it will be parallel to the faces of the slot, I know that my material can then, my, my planar material can then ride along the midline parallel between those faces and it should be geometrically compatible. I'm gonna hold down the mouse here to get a selection of, of selections behind the cursor and see I wanna pick that face that's down in there rotate the view slightly just for convenience, do the same thing on the other side, and just find here, there we go, that's the exact face. So I've picked two faces, and now I get a new plane, if we zoom out a little bit, you can see that the two planes are not, they're not quite coplanar. There's, there's a subtle, uh, kind of see it there, there's a subtle angle between them. So that's the error that I, that I allowed before. And now we wanna use the new fa uh, plane that will be definitely perpendicular to the face of the play field, and make for a cleaner design and a clean fit. So just to sort of uh, make this happen, I'm gonna take the old plane, and I'm just gonna delete it. That'll break things. It's, it's warning me, it's referenced by their features, but then we'll go and fix that. So we're gonna delete it. And now as we roll forward, the next step here is we uh, start to create the barrier. And if I simply roll all the way forward, we'll see that something comes up in yellow. So there's a warning. Something isn't defined exactly right. And we created the barrier part, that, was, that, that can still hold true, but the sketch now doesn't have a well-defined plane. I'm gonna right click on my sketch and say redefine sketch plane, and now pick the new revised plane and see what happens. And lo and behold, things did get a little askew here. My barrier part has flipped around to the wrong side. So that's kind of a challenge. Um, here's a funny thing now, if I go back and redefine my, my plane here, and pick the same faces in the opposite order. Let's see what happens. The plane will have the same geometric extent, but lo and behold, my part is at least on the right side. So that means it didn't break it quite as badly. Let's go now uh, patch up that sketch. I'm gonna edit the sketch. So I'm gonna reactivate the part just to make sure I'm really in the right part. This is the barrier part. And I'm gonna go edit that sketch and see what I can fix here. So um, what's happening? Okay, at this point, okay, um, I can see that there's some features in green, which basically means that some of my previous projections are no longer valid, which isn't so surprising. So we can, the most easy way to fix that is simply to reproject the lines that we care about as definitions. I get in here, I can pick that say project, this time I'm gonna project them both in one go.
Okay, so now I have reprojected those lines. And now if I redefine my uh, tab center lines, I'm going to find the green line from before and delete it. And now um, add a coincident constraint between the reprojected lines and the appropriate endpoints. Okay, now I'm going to fumble with Fusion for a minute. I may edit some of this out. Okay, I completed fixing up the barrier part after my major change of plane. It took a little more time than I care to admit, uh, mostly because there were it took a little time to decode exactly which relations needed to be, uh, which constraints needed to be deleted and updated. Um, maybe the lesson of the story is uh, when you see a warning sign, like when I originally imported the cross axes, they weren't a point, they were a line. That should have been a hint to me that I didn't have neatly perpendicular geometry and I should have stopped then and fixed it, but I had continued. The second thing is under constrained parts can sometimes really break badly when you change something. So often adding more dimensions and fully constraining things will just help with future fixes so that things don't get all wonky once you know one thing is broken and everything else has a lot of freedom to move to erratic positions. But at this point we have at least a fix up. I can finish that sketch and turn the play field back on and turn the strut back on and uh, go back to the top level. And now if I look at the top, the end face of that barrier part and notice I have moved it in the meantime, it's a little longer and sticks out. That's a separate thing to fix. If I do the look at now on this, we see that it's, it is now neatly perpendicular to the face of the play field as will make for a good fit and actually be appropriate for the problem. Now this does suggest to us why the cross brace might be problematic. When you're dealing with flat laser cut material, you can't miter the edges. They cut at a perpendicular to the face. So to actually find another part place here for a, a brace that would be perpendicular to both the play field and the base it would have to be parallel to the strut. It's the only geometry that allows you to have a plane that ends up being uh, correctly perpendicular along all axes. So instead what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to create a small cross brace that doesn't actually cross between the top play field and the bottom foot. That just separately braces the strut to the foot and that'll provide a little bit more stiffness. So uh, to think that through, we're going we're gonna to create a part that in lie in the plane that, along which we're looking here. It'll be vertical have a flat face against the uh, foot, and then it's meeting a perpendicular face. We're basically making a, a, the third wall of the corner of a box using the strut and the foot as reference planes. And that will provide a lot of stiffness. And if we added a similar part or copy the part between the strut and the play field, we could radically stiffen that connection. And then um, there's still gonna be potentially a hinge line on the, on the strut, but that will be much less of a problem for actually building. So let's think through, um, once again, we want a plane uh, along which to draw that's just in all on the midline. So we can go ahead and uh, construct a working plane for that. And this time I can, well, I can just use offset plane because I know that things are along right angles. Oops, uh, that, once again, the ellipse line is not truly a, um, I'm having trouble with selecting the line I wanted there. I'm trying to put it directly along the midline of the ellipse. And so I was trying to uh, select the midline from the sketch of the ellipse, which is turning out to be problematic. There's not a construction line there, is there? Oh, I'm sorry, I did the wrong. I want to construct a planar angle. Okay, try again here. Now we can construct the edge. Uh, and this time the 90 will work because I just know that things are orthogonal. And I get a vertical plane right along where I want my part to go. So we're going to um, uh, construct the part first and then add the appropriate slots kind of as a fix up after the fact. Let's create a new component. We're going to call it uh, cross brace. And I'm going to pick that plane and uh, pick the plane I just used and create a sketch on it. And now we're looking down the line here. So I'm going to just uh, import as reference the top edge and the bottom edge visible edges in this case of the ellipse as projected geometry. And um, I'm going to also pick the projected faces of the strut as, as projected geometry. These will give me lots of reference lines against which to draw my part here. Um, okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and just isolate. Uh, so I'm dealing only with the parts I care about. And I'm going to turn each of these back into real construction lines just to avoid uh, confusion. 
Okay, so now I know that at least the, the lines along which my part should get drawn, more or less, and I can go ahead and draw some kind of part. Uh, we're going to proceed now with drawing the cross brace. I didn't sketch it on paper first, and that was a mistake. If I had done so, I might have more properly visualized what I wanted before uh, just jumping in here, but here we are. I'm going to just complete the part. I want a midline for symmetry. We're going to use that uh, a few times here. And I'm going to draw a, a kind of a basic part profile, and I'm going to mirror it after the fact. So I'm going to just draw some lines, um, and we're going to use a half lap joint. We're going to have some width across the face of the foot, um, some uh, amount coming up. Um, we're going to come up to the face of the strut, and I could add a wedge shape here, or I'm just going to depend upon having a long contact. And the idea is I'm going to come down and come across, uh, and that will we'll end up adding a slot to the uh, strut to provide some room for this cross part, but it will first slot onto the bottom of the strut and then together press down into the foot, and that will give me a path toward assembly. Now I'm going to go ahead and, in the sketch itself, uh, mirror these lines to so automatically create the right kind of mirrored relationship for my, um, my foot feature. And there we have a profile for a foot that should work. And that's enough to get us um, a kind of bracing part without too much work. Honestly, I don't even really need a tab in the bottom. Maybe we'll keep it simple and just let this all kind of press together. And it could always be glued for a little stiffness. One thing we care about is we want to make sure that this part is not too weak. So we're going to always want to make sure this has like some minimum material. And then just for symmetry, we're going to make sure that it has the equal amount of... Actually, that's not going to work. We're just going to um, dimension the upper part here to be the same length. I got the wrong dimensional thing there. Okay, there we go. Seven, eight. Um, it, okay, we're gonna we're gonna just fumble with this dimension dimensioning scheme here and hope that things stay stable. Let's give it a, a concrete width, just so that things don't go too wonky on us. Um, let's give it a concrete height, fifteen. And the only thing left there is uh, the are these side angles, and they're just not that crucial. So I'm gonna just let them float for now. Okay, so there we have um, a profile for a uh, a bracing part that can go across the. There we go. Symmetric. Whole distance. Six millimeters. Get a new body. There's a brace. Let's go back and see it in context, and then we can think about how this might work. So um, I'm going to go ahead and bring make everything visible again. So uh, all right, so there we, there we have a, an example for how the strut might work. And currently those parts actually intersect. If we were to look at the let's look at adding the slot to the strut that will accept the half lap of the cross brace. So what we can see here is, if I look at once again at my analysis, is I have a cross section and the um, there's a missing slot that will accept the center part of the cross brace in the bottom of the strut. So turning off that analysis, um, let's go ahead and uh, enter the or activate the uh, strut part because that's what we're going to edit. And we're going to begin by um, simply creating a sketch on one face to use as a basis for our cut. Create a new sketch. Now I want this sketch to be referenced to existing features. So I'm going to go back and then kind of carefully select a couple of line edges here of, from the other part to use as reference. So for example, if I pick uh, this edge and I project that into our current sketch, that'll give me the, um, the position of the half lap and the position of the side plane. Um, and then on the other side, to get the material thickness, I can uh, use the other element here as well. Um, I'm basically depending on the fact that the slots will be, I'm drawing them exactly on size and depending on the fact that they'll cut a little oversized, might be a little wiggle, but I can probably just glue these, in, glue these in place to kind of get them fully fixed. Um, so that gives me two projection lines. And then in my sketch, I'm going to just make sure that those are dashed lines to avoid confusion. Um, and now just to kind of keep things very clear, I'm going to turn off the body of the strut so I don't have it cluttering my view and turn off the cross brace so I don't have it cluttering my view. And that lets me more precisely get that. Okay, so now I can draw uh, my half lap simply as a box. And the idea is I'm not going to have any dimensions here. I'm going to use the endpoints of the existing geometry to define uh, where I want my box corners to be in, in this particular plane. 
if I can get my coincident to work, corner point. And then I'm going to use the, um, the same line I had before. I'm going to turn off the foot for a second. Okay, so there, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to also project, I think, that other line in as well um, to use as a basis for um, turn off the foot. The adding a collinear constraint for the bottom of my feature there and there. So now I have a, a, a projected view of the slot that will is entirely referenced to existing geometry and will be associative to everything else. So I don't need to add any more numbers. I can finish the sketch. I can accept that and I can, um, in this case, just add it as a cut feature. I'm going to make sure the body of the strut is visible. And as is my suggestion always, I'm going to reference it directly to the faces instead of having a distance embedded here by saying that instead of a distance, it's going to go to object and pick the back face of the strut. So now the cut will be a, a notch exactly in the back of, um, of the strut. Okay, and we're going to want to have something similar in the top edge because we want to brace the back of the play field. Um, so rather than make yet another feature, um, I'm going to just simply go back now into the same sketch. Uh, yes, it's this sketch and edit it. And now I'm also going to just turn off the play field for visibility and the barrier, just making everything a little clear. And I get my choice of where to place it. Because I'm, remember, I'm going to insert the brace in onto the strut part before I assemble anything else. And so we're not going to have any other dependencies here. At this point, I can create just another rectangle. I'm going to actually create it specifically as a three-point rectangle and just kind of pick a convenient spot, kind of, um, oh, it's like there and there. And now I'm going to use um, just some equality constraints to set the dimensions to match, because I know that this other slot will have the correct dimensions. And then later we'll be able to copy a part into place. Um, make it collinear with the visible edge. Okay, and that wall is there. And we, we actually have a freedom about where it's located. It can locate anywhere along these points. Um, so, uh, we're just going to kind of visibly place it at a reasonable spot, but we're actually are going to add a, a dimension with respect to some other feature just so that we, uh, it's not, it's not sort of floating around as we modify their things. That'll give at least a sort of definite uh, location, which we could fix if we need to. And then, um, when we have to once again, back and fix up our extrusion of the cut, uh, to... Um, include that other feature because they're considered separate profiles. And then we have to cut for two notches. And that part is, has some notches in it, but it'll still be strong enough to work. All right, so at this point, let's go back up to the top level and just uh, make everything visible again. We want a, the play field, the foot, the barrier, the cross brace all visible. And um, this is at least, I haven't done the copies yet. I'm going to do that in a separate video. But that gives me at least now a sort of viable design for a braced structure, um, including thinking through the assembly sequence a little bit. And I'm going to save a version at this point um, and say adding cross brace. Okay, so we're going to pick up separately with copying and locating parts in space and exporting to DXF.